Hey guys, just a reminder, my online course is Birth Story Academy and you can enroll in it at birthstory.com. It's taught by me. You can be in your jammies. It's online. It's pre-recorded and it has a ton of freebies and downloads. It's everything that you need to prepare for your hospital birth. So hope to see you in Birth Story Academy. Okay, we are back with Kelly for part two, and this episode does not require a trigger warning. This episode is the continuation of Kelly, the labor nurse's stories, and these are her final two pregnancies and her rainbow babies with Riley and Clayton. If you are interested in learning a little bit more about chatting with a labor and delivery nurse and her first birth with her nine-year-old Reed and then listening to miscarriage stories, two of them, one at six weeks, one at 11 weeks, if you haven't listened to part one, we do welcome you to go back and with that trigger warning, listen to part one. If you've already listened, great. Thanks for being here in the continuation. And I hope you're just as excited as I am to listen to these beautiful, beautiful, unmedicated, very empowered rainbow baby birth stories. Okay, let's get to it. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Okay, Kelly, we're just going to continue on with your story now in part two for Riley and Clayton, your rainbow babies. So let's yeah. start with Riley. How old is Riley right now? She just turned four. Awesome. And then how old is Clayton? He just turned two. Two. Okay. So we have a nine, a four, and a two-year-old. And where we just left off, Kelly, was a really dark, sad, tragic place. And that's why we cut Mm -hmm. that episode off. (laughs) And so (laughs) this episode, we want to celebrate birth and rainbow babies and light and give hope and um, just give hope to those out there that need it. So tell me about getting pregnant with Riley. Um, So yeah, like I said, I started my job on labor delivery, my dream job. I was working through the NAPRO technology, trying to figure out cervical mucus, fertile times, you know, ideal times getting pregnant, or was I possibly low in certain hormones? That's kind of what NAPRO shows. And I'll never forget, it was New Year's Day, 11 days past ovulation, and I just took a test on a whim, and sure enough, I was pregnant, and that, you know, took a few months. And I was so excited, but I was terrified. I mean, I remember, like, shaking and feeling like I was going to have a panic attack looking at this pregnancy test. And I want to say before, like the negative showed up before the positive. So I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, you're crazy. Quit peeing on sticks. And then there was the positive and I thought, Oh my gosh, this is real. This is really happening. I ended up emailing my OB. He quickly responded. Um, he had talked about, let's, let's go in, let's see your progesterone level. Let's see what the HCG level says. 
we checked that um and then we checked it again and things were moving right along my hcg was more than doubling my progesterone was more than adequate so that was super exciting but again there's tons of anxiety there so the first appointment we did i think a seven week ultrasound and everything looked good but he did tell me you know they noted a subchorionic hemorrhage mm -hmm. and you know he talked about the risk with that of how it could lead to increased risk of bleeding there's always the risk of miscarriage um he also had put me on progesterone supplements the minute i found out i was pregnant by the way okay. um and around that time i had started a baby aspirin supplement as well as i'd been doing back root for a few months to help with my hormones and getting a regular period and he was still supportive of me trying those things. But him telling me that, I appreciated his honesty, but that did not help my anxiety. Yeah. And um, I just remember looking at him and I was like, you know, I didn't hear all the statistics of, but this, this many women go on to have normal pregnancies, this many women go on to deliver vag. Like, I didn't hear that. All I heard was increased risk of miscarriage and possibility of bleeding. So panic and he was like you know i will be willing to see you every two weeks if that puts your mind at ease and i thought oh my gosh thank you so every two weeks i would go in for an ultrasound and i still remember the week i went in for an ultrasound and it was the same time frame i lost the other one and i was just my blood pressure was insanely high. I don't remember what it was but i was just shaky and i explained i said i'm so sorry i'm just really nervous and I told them why, and they immediately got me in for an ultrasound, and things were perfect. Baby was moving. Um, so her pregnancy after the progesterone supplements went off very well without a hitch. Um, but again, it what kind of fueled my fire to change, make birth different for her was how birth went with my firstborn, but also working in a teaching hospital. <laughs> And seeing how birth is treated, um, I'm sorry, he just woke up from that. No, how birth hold was on, treated. you guys. Listen, Kelly just whispers to me, like mouths to me, I'm sorry, because her baby is trying to snuggle and nurse and take time with her. Like, do not apologize for that. Like, you know, like Clayton's going to be part of this podcast. So like, here you are, bud. You right? know, here's the, yeah, that's his debut. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There you go. He knows what I'm talking about. Him. So it's but, yeah, okay. Working... He can he can just help you tell your story. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, so working in the birth industry, really kind of in a teaching hospital, you know, lots of interventions. Um, I will go ahead and say it. Really cervical exams, which I do not agree with. It, it created more anxiety. So here I am, so scared. I'm hurry. I just want this baby to be here. Did you, know, you just, just say I've... hourly cervical exams? Yes, I did. I've yes, lied. I did. Sometimes I think I live in like the Mecca of birthing. I mean, never. That yeah. would like never go down here, ever. Like that's so no. gross. That's such a Friedman's curve mentality, you know? Yeah. And for those who don't know what Friedman's curve is, it was basically, there was a doctor in the 1950s who did this one-time study, very biased study on these women who were, over 90% of them were sedated and basically forceps delivery, mind you. And that's how it became the whole, the cervix should dilate around this time, during this period of time. And then it's like, no. and you know, since then, many <clears throat> organizations are even like, no, we need to practice that way. So, yes, our really cervical exam. Oh so, my you can God, see that's we're... so gross. That's obstetrical violence. That's honestly, I'm going to say a word that people are going to like be angry about. But to me, that's molestation. Like, there is no world in which that is evidence based care. No, it doesn't, it it's is just not. It is not. And, you know, I might catch some flack for this, but. As a teaching hospital, you think you'd want to teach evidence-based good habits, not 
those sort of habits. Yeah. Not, in my opinion, poor habits. That is not evidence-based practice. That is, you know, that is expecting a body to do something and just an untimely it's manner. Just in, and I just introducing so much bacteria. Like I can't even yes. imagine their rate of chorioamnionitis when <laughs> if they're doing that post rupture too. Like, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes. So yes. Kelly, we need to also go back though because the audience may not be clear on what a subchorionic hematoma or a subchorionic hemorrhage is, mm -hmm. which is what your OB saw in your ultrasound. Um, I know all about it. I've covered it on the podcast. I have a ton of clients with them. Um, yeah. I will say uh, every single client I've ever had with a subchorionic hematoma or hemorrhage, everyone has been fine. Um, yeah. So tell me or tell the audience like what that is, what that means for pregnancy. Yeah. So essentially it's separate like space between this, like it's separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. I, I'm not gonna lie. I'm kind of cringing right now because I'm thinking if I ever get any of my verbiage wrong, my OB people are gonna be like, Kelly. <laughs> but um, it's basically separation, but the blood flow is still there. And the problem with that is, I mean, they can get to be very large. I mean, five centimeters. Yeah, they're nine, like big blood six. clots that like pull blood that pulls behind mm -hmm. the placenta. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to <laughs> call it like a placental abruption, how it detaches, but in theory, it's that's kind of a great way to explain it because the placenta is like you said, there's that blood clot or, and sometimes there's the hematoma and other times there's active bleeding involved. And some women will come into the ER soaking through pads. I mean, just heavy, mm -hmm. God awful amounts of bright red bleeding at that. And it does, I mean, can you imagine the anxiety of every time you just start gushing blood thinking, well, I'm either miscarrying or this is the subchorionic hemorrhage. Yeah. And, and it's pretty it normal just, to bleed for like 20 weeks or so, right? Yes. It can take a long time to heal. And, you know, they can. They can lead to miscarriage because if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually, yeah, it is essentially the placenta sloughs off. And, it, it, I mean, you basically could at that point. You know, I could be wrong. Call it an abruption at that point. But following um, or it could two... cut off blood flow to baby. Yeah, and following two miscarriages, mm -hmm. the last thing you want to hear is that you have a subchorionic hematoma where you <laughs> will likely experience bleeding. Yes. And you know what's wild? Like, I tried really hard to get kind of like on a spiritual side with her. I tried really hard to kind of get to like a mind body, try to calm my nerves. And I just was like, I am not going to bleed. I am not going to bleed. This isn't going to happen. <laughs> Because I mentally can't handle it. I cannot mentally handle this. And it never happened. Wow. Is that not wild? I it mean, didn't heal. Girl, I just got back from a 10-day yoga retreat on the, like, coast of Panama and Costa Rica. <laughs> like, I definitely believe in manifestation and visualization yes. and, all of, and all of that. Like, 100%. And I work... Um, like Dr. Thorpe is an overseeing obstetrician from the um, mm -hmm. Chapel Hill. He's really like, I think the director of obstetrics at Chapel Hill. And he kind of oversaw my book, Birth Story and Birth Story Academy, my online course, making sure everything's medically accurate. And I'll never forget a quote that he said to me when we were going through the process of writing the book and stuff. And he said, Heidi, when we go looking for things, we find things. So yes. the more we ultrasound like every two weeks and stuff, while it does give peace of mind, like these incidental findings are going to pop yes. up Yes, because so much is unknown about the development yes. of a baby from cells to delivery, you know? And so, Oh, totally. <laughs> when you, whenever you peek in, you know, we're yes. going to find things. So well, incidental yes. finding well, like for you. Yeah, well, that's like, you know, not to get off track, but like, they're wanting to do like maternity belts now and test them out to see if they can detect changes in the baby's heart rate sooner to like save babies. And I'm like, oh my gosh, our C-section rate is going to go so high if that gets approved. Because we don't know. We don't know what babies do in the womb 24-7. I guarantee you babies have so many dips in their heart rate 
all the time that we don't know. <clears throat> Let's go get water that I don't know about. And so there were that we don't know about. And so, yeah, exactly. You go looking for something. You're going to find you something. are every time I have a client go to triage. And I, I'm sure you see this in labor and delivery. More people go to triage not in labor than in labor. There's lots of reasons we need to go to triage, right? So every time a client goes to triage, yeah, there is always a heart rate acceleration that looks tachycardic. And then some sort of yes. weird deceleration that looks bradycardic. And it's like, okay, if you look at my Apple Watch all day long, 100% yes. you are going to see heartbeats in the 40s. I work out. That's who yes. I am. You're also going to see heart rates in the 175s when I'm working out. <laughs> yes. And all the things in between. If you just look like, oh, gosh, Heidi's going from 45 to 175. I mean, yeah, like it's all relative. Like if you're not symptomatic, if you know, all the things. So when we go looking, we find, um, and please, I mean, listen, if these maternity belts could save lives, you know, great. I'm all about Learn, oh, learn. Yeah, sure. I'll learn about the data. We'll consider it. But um, yeah, I mean, you will see C-sections. I'm going to do a quick plug right here, Kelly, as we're going into this mm -hmm. first story. F I think following this episode, Count the Kicks with a labor and delivery nurse, Roxanne, is coming on the yeah. podcast. And I want you guys to look for that episode. It is amazing yes. data. Now that's the data that I'm getting behind, which is looking yes. at a baby individually and what Count the Kicks does. Yes. Count the Kicks yes. says, how long does it take my baby to have 10 movements? My that's baby. exactly how I used to teach it when I taught childbirth classes. I was like, I don't care what the textbook says. What your baby does is what you need to focus on. If your baby gets 10 kicks in five minutes all the time, that's what's normal. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And it, then if all of a sudden one day it takes your baby 50 minutes to get 10 movements, go yes. to triage. Go to triage. Something I'm excited changed. for that episode. Yeah, I am too. So anyway, I just wanted to plug it real quick because it's coming up. Um, I love that you're momming it so hard right now in this episode. I love it. This is real. This is raw. Like, she's, like, fixing snacks, walking around, breastfeeding, and talking to me. This is amazing. And meanwhile, I sent my kids away. I was like, stop bothering me. No, you're good. I can't possibly be bothered for this podcast interview. So, um, all right, Kelly. So, you didn't bleed, which is... I did not bleed at all, which was just crazy because every appointment they're like, how is your bleeding on that? Like, actually, it's not happening at all. Yes. And so. Now, was the hematoma was so resolving? Was it getting smaller? It, I actually don't think it got smaller in resolve because it was still there at my anatomy scan. Okay. But um, eventually it healed up and went away. And you know what? I always wanted to check the placenta to see if you could see it, but. You know, when oh. you're in the moment of, oh, my God, I just had a baby, I totally forgot. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you how many undiagnosed hematomas there are because I oh, encapsulate yeah. the placentas. And so I look at them and I explore them and I clean them and I steam them and all this kind of stuff. And I am pulling out blood clots like you wouldn't even believe. Um, oh, wow. It's And every placenta looks so different. It's very cool. But I digress. Yes. <laughs> so tell me how the rest of your pregnancy went. Like after you yes. went through, you got over, once you got past 11 weeks, which was the mm -hmm. the last, um, the last lost and that trauma, like, did you ever, did you ever relax? No. Okay. <laughs> I really didn't. It's, I did and I didn't. But at the same time, it was. It was a very emotional and spiritual journey with her because there's just so many factors that came into play with it. But part of it was I became so in tune with my body that I literally, first time I felt her was 16 weeks. I mean, I could literally feel her moving like little tiny flutters. I'll never forget feeling her kick for the first time. So I just became very, very in tune, but I was just so ready to meet her because unfortunately working in labor delivery, you see... You see all those things that do scare you or those, you know, people that come in and they're the same, they're as far along as you are. And so I could relax to a degree. And when I would like sit down and take time my, for myself and focus on her moving, I would relax. But in the end, I just, 
I wanted birth to go well and I wanted her to be here. Okay. So, but I just kept trucking along. I kept working out. Um, I remember my OB offered, he had asked me at 37 weeks if I wanted a membrane sleep and I declined and um, people kept asking me when my induction date was because that's what they do. A lot of teaching hospital minus right now the staffing, they don't do that as often. You know, it's interesting. But, um, they don't do membrane sweeps before 39 weeks in my city. Like it's so different. Yeah. Like the like I know it's so so different. So different. Like advocacy, no matter where you live in in the world, understanding what your institutions recommendations, policies, procedures, like ask so many yes. questions because you could listen to this podcast and you could hear someone say this. Oh, I was offered a membrane sweep at 37 weeks. And the next person I interview says, oh, they wouldn't do a membrane sweep until I got to, to 39 weeks, you know? Yes. Well, and there's some, some hospitals that, you know, they'll rupture you. Uh, right. Accidentally four centimeters on dilated minus three. Yeah. Accidentally and on purpose. There's other, oh, sorry. Yeah. And then there's some places that until you are Seven, six centimeters dilated with that baby way down, they won't even consider it a rum yeah. breaking the water. So it is crazy how different places practice for sure. But um, yeah, I declined and you know, I did have them check my cervix a few times, but around that time I was doing the date um and the raspberry leaf tea and just really focusing on on labor and then I'll never forget, I was 30, I think I was 38 weeks and five days. I had just gotten home from a 13-hour shift, and my husband and I set up talking, and um, I he was like, do you want to watch the show? I said, you know what? I am exhausted. I just want to go to bed. I work the next day. I just want to go to bed. And so I take a shower, I hike my leg up to dry myself off. And all of a sudden, it just sounded like someone turned the faucet on. And I was like, what is going on? And I looked down and my water had broke, which the hilarious part about that was I was nesting hardcore the day before. I mean, scrubbing on my hands and knees, cleaning windows. I never clean windows. And then my water broke on the floor and I was excited because I was like, we're going to have to think but at the same time, I was like, I just cleaned this floor. <laughs> and I just want to go to sleep. Uh. Yes. And that's where I was like, no. And so I had already told my husband from the beginning, I was like, I do not want family there. Last time it was too much. Well, we did call his parents because they were watching our oldest for us. And I had called my OB, let him know. And I had also, um, we let my mom know. And, um, so we're headed to, we went ahead and headed to the hospital. Contractions hadn't really started yet, but we went ahead and headed to the hospital and my friend was working that night and it worked out great. I was like, I need you to be my nurse. Cause she knew a lot of the like trauma I had dealt with and she had been through miscarriages. So she was very understanding. And I had told her my concerns for being pushed into doing something I didn't want to do. And okay. so she was definitely like, it was just so good that she was there that night, but Okay, so I'm going to ask you a hard question. Yeah. Because as a doula, I'm not going to say like I would never allow because my clients have body autonomy. But typically mm -hmm. when someone has PROM, premature rupture of the membranes, meaning like the onset mm -hmm. of your labor is your water breaking. Um, we usually recommend that they stay at home until they're in active labor, two to three minutes apart, 60 to 90 seconds. What sent mm -hmm. you into the hospital so fast um honestly that's just teaching hospital they teach you if your water breaks to come on in i know i know and just with having her i was like in that anxiety and then just she wasn't moving immediately after i was just immediately like oh my god what if there's a cord in the way you know i just okay. immediately all of that is valid you know yeah. while fear is 
usually irrational when you're a labor and delivery nurse and you've had trauma, it's actually quite real. So um, yeah. I was just wondering, like for the audience, because the, you'll hear me say over and over again, if yeah. you experience prom, you don't have a fever, you are having good fetal movements, which you said your movements were different. So if the movements are the mm-hmm. same and they're good, then, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, but like talk to your provider about maybe staying home for a while. Yes, um, which actually on that note, remind Ask me that again when we get to Clayton's story okay. because okay. there's definitely a reason with that one. Okay. So, so we head to the hospital. My mom's and my mom's there. Oh, and God. I'm like, okay, we yes, love we you, mom. At, I think I know we get there at 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I will say this my mom is a wonderful woman. She is a saint in my book. She is wonderful. And um, I was not happy. <laughs> because we had specifically said we did not want family there. And so it was just kind of funny how that night happened because I'm anxious. I'm like, I want to get labor started because I don't want to be ruptured for too long and get talked into Pitocin because I was so terrified of Pitocin. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, I know I need to rest. I tell people it's really labor rest. Yeah. Rest. And so I just, again, all this anxiety is going crazy. And there's this one resident who I am not talking bad on her. I love her. She is my ride or die to this day. I love her to death. But, um, and in her defense, I think she just gets used to how things were ran there, which my doctor's not like that. Let me just tell you, he is not like that at all. Um, cause even he said, we don't need to start the test right away. Let her do her thing. Um, she did kind of bug me multiple times throughout the night wanting to cervical check wanting to see when I was ready for Pitocin and I finally and I was getting frustrated you know I hadn't slept all night because my husband and mom snored on the couch (laughs) I couldn't sleep because of them snoring but then they kept bothering me about the cervical check and a Pitocin and I finally told my nurse I said I swear if they come back in here I'm cussing them out and so she walked up to this resident and again like I said I absolutely love her and if she's listening she knows I love her to death but she even told her she goes you just shouldn't go back in there good and (laughs) um so yeah I was done so early that morning um my doctor did come in to talk to me because like every once in a while I'd have a contraction but then just nothing nothing would happen okay but I'm gonna pause you there Kelly I got Mm -hmm. to Okay, because you're in a teaching hospital, but I want to talk about evidence-based care. Evidence-based <laughs> care shows that when someone ruptures their water pre, uh, well, it's prom. So, um, pre, oh my God, I cannot talk today. <laughs> you're good. Can we all just laugh together? <laughs> so <laughs> premature, meaning before your labor begins, rupture of the membrane. So when prom happens, data shows that most people start contractions within six to eight hours. So like, let's say whatever yes. the percentages are the, of that would make up the majority. There is a really good yeah. podcast episode on this on evidence-based yeah. birth podcast. A <laughs> shout out to that one. But the majority, it takes six or eight hours for your body to be like, oh, okay. Now the rest of that group that doesn't go into labor in six or eight hours another chunk will be in labor by 12 hours and then the mm-hmm. ma- like the majority of everyone is laboring within 24 hours some 48 yes. hours but okay so, so actually, as, on that note yeah um so water broke about 9 30 ish okay p.m so yeah that is a good timeline to go off of so um my doctor came in um I think it was 645 and he was like, how's things going? And he goes, I heard you had some frustrations overnight. And I was like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. And um, he was so awesome. He, he was like, well, what do you want to do? And I, and I said, are you here to push pit? And he goes, he goes, we could start pit. He goes, you know, it's been a few hours. He goes, we could absolutely start it. He goes, or we can give it time. It's up to you. And at that point, I was like, oh, and he goes, have you eaten yet? And I said, no. And he goes, okay. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I sat there for a moment and I thought, do I give it more time? Do I not? And again, the anxiousness got to me. And I said, if we start pit, I said, I want to go as slow as possible. I want to be in control. 
I said, I've been feeling it in my back lately. So if I'm going to really give this a shot of a different birth experience, I was like, I, I'm going to need to be in control of this. And he said, yeah. And he goes, um, he goes, we can turn it off from time to time. You could get a break. He goes, you can labor at the tub if you want. Um, Oh, I you can know, kiss said, him. Good. Said, yes. Key. Yes, yes. You can turn it down. Yes. You yes. can turn it off. Yes. You can take a break. Oh, yes. Things that we don't hear and, enough about Pitocin. Yes. And that's, that's honestly how it should be. And that's something I always preach to my clients. I'm like, I don't have to do anything. I can turn it off the minute you say to turn it off. And so he was very like, he's like, you know, if that's what you want to do, we can do a little bit. We had a time an anesthesiologist who was very strict there. And so there was like no eating on the floor at all. And so my doctor, he had came back in and asked about breakfast. And I was like, actually, yes, I am hungry. And so he had, you know, he had warned me, just don't eat anything too crazy heavy. Because if you do go into labor quickly, you don't want to get sick, which I totally respected that. So I am... Being someone who's like um, pretty athletic, who works out, who runs, I kind of treated it like a workout. So I made sure I had, I carved up, I had pancakes nice. and I had, I think a little bit of sausage just for protein and then I was good to go. So um, at eight o'clock we started Pitocin. So this was about 10 and a half hours post rupture. We started Pitocin and I had said I wanted to go up, um, and he was even gonna let. He was even cool with the rate. Like he was like, "Do you just want to start with one?" I said, "Let's just start with two because the standard of where I work at is." And again, I don't agree with this, but it's um, we start at a dose of two, and then it increases every fifteen. And um, Woo, that's I did not want fast. that. Goodness. That's very fast. And you know, it takes like over 20 minutes for the body to fully respond to that one dose. So you know where I'm going with that as well. I am like, I'm just in shock. So here they do one or two every 30 to 60 minutes. Oh my gosh. I need to move where you are. <laughs> are they, are they hiring right now? I was like, um, sounds... and doulas are also allowed in triage in PACU, wow. in anesthesia, and in the OR. Like, we have very friendly, and guess what? I'll just say this. They published, oh, I'm not going to say which hospital system, but they shared <laughs> their data with us last night, which was so incredible, okay? That sounds seriously amazing. And let's I'm just say, fantastic. let's just say their C-section rates are way oh, low, that's low way low like 19 percent. oh yeah i mean you know i can't imagine why there's intolerance when you up the pit that fast so no. or hemorrh- yeah so i hemorrhages often- it's so that they can yes. the sales reps yes. can sell jada for the hemorrhages i mean don't we could go on yes. and on okay well anyway oh, you have an amazing provider who was like you know what kelly you can be in control of this Okay. Yes. And, and so chose. I, I opted to start it too. Okay. And I wanted to increase it every 30 minutes. Okay. Perfect. And because I just, I was like, I'm going to give this a shot, but I know that the toast and contractions cause can eventually become from what I witnessed with my patients can become too much, too okay. hard to making it very hard to achieve that natural. What's birth. that medical word? Now, it's called like tacky, um, tacky systole. And I do systole. get tacky systole. Okay. Um, you know, I did with my firstborn and keep in mind, I had only known <laughs> cervical contractions. Um, and so that's what I was anticipating. I was anticipating that very hard contraction. And so at eight o'clock, my nurse was fantastic, by the way. She, she knew like, give me space. I get, I, I just work well with my husband. I don't need anybody else. I prefer not to have an audience, like leave me alone. Then when I really need that help, then you can be at bedside. And that's honestly how I treat my patients as well. Like I'll let you do your thing, but as you need more support, if you need me, I'll be there. But if you work well with your husband, I'll just be a fly on the wall for doing a few monitoring things. And, um, so at this point, 
She upped it at 8, 8.30. And at 9 o'clock, I just dozed off, and I woke up to a contraction, and she put it at 6. And that's when I was, like, realizing that I had only contracted that one time since I had seen my doctor. And so I was like, Kelly, you have got to get up and move. You've got to get these contractions going or the Pitocin is just going to get higher. So at this point, we started doing just some movements. And keep in mind, I didn't know, I don't, I didn't know the positioning like the back of my hand like I do now. And that's what makes the next birth just so cool too, is just knowing how the body navigates. Yeah. Have and, you done a spinning um, babies training? Not so much an official spinning babies training because thank you, COVID. Every time I signed up for their class, it canceled. Yeah. And so I just did a lot of self-study. I followed a ton of people on social media. And then I just really, it's just, I don't even know how to begin. It's just trying different things, knowing, okay, this opens the pelvis this way. This opens the pelvis that way. Okay. I'm going to blow and your mind I, right now, Kelly. In my city in Charlotte. Both hospital mm -hmm. systems have paid for spinning babies to come twice in the last year and provided the training for free for all birth workers, including every labor and delivery nurse and any doula or birth worker that wanted to attend. Oh my gosh, that's it. I'm done. I'm moving. <laughs> Make space for me. I'm I'm so done. Come on. Come on down. <laughs> Goodbye, Kansas. Goodbye, rural Kansas. Come on down. Well, I think oh the reason gosh. I wanted to mention this is because maybe some of your coworkers or your doctor or, you know, there may be people in Kansas that are listening to this episode. And I want mm -hmm. the world to know we're not A plus plus here in Charlotte. But we're doing a better job than a lot of other places, right? It is cool to see how different places, 100%, every hospital mm -hmm. definitely practices differently. So that is cool. I know, actually, my doctor did take a spinning babies class when I was pregnant with my daughter. So cool. he's a good guy. But your um, intuition was like, it's daytime. Get up, move around, work with the yes, work with Because in my head, I'm like, you're going to need to do what you can to decrease the intervention. Yeah. And um, so I got up, I started, what are you doing, kid? I started moving <laughs> and I started, I remember hiking my left leg on a chair and that's kind of what got the contractions to happen more and more okay. all in my back. That's what I had with my firstborn. That's okay. what I'm having again. I'm like, well, okay, I guess this is just how it's meant to be. <laughs> and my nurse came in around 9.30. She's like, well, how are you feeling? And I said, you know, I'm actually feeling some contraction. So let's not touch the pit this time. She goes, cool. Call me when you need me. I said, oh. good for you. Yes. And so she left. She's like, I'll let you do your thing. And she left, left me alone. And at that point, my husband and I started trying to do the whole abdominal lift and tuck thing to see if we could get contractions going or could we... Um, get them maybe to switch course away from back labor. So we did about 10 of those and they all of a sudden intensified. And so if, if this gives you a timeline, I will tell you, um, before we started pit, I did go ahead and have my doctor check me. And I think I was maybe a two and a half. Okay. So keep in mind the timeline here. So that was okay. right before we started Pitocin. And at we started at 8. At 9.30, I said, let's not up it. I'm feeling contractions. By 10.30, the contractions intensity-wise was super doable. Because again, all I ever knew was the cervical contractions. These were still very doable. In fact, hands and knees at that point was my best friend. I needed to go pee though. And at 1030, I was very frustrated because here I am trying to go pee and I'm getting them back to back to back to the point I thought I was going to throw up. Okay. And I was mad. I like, I went from being in my zone, listening to this, um, listening to songs with my earbuds to just, I was like, at this, I'm pissed. <laughs> and so I told Were my you nurse, like, I said, turn it, it down. <laughs> no, I said, that's it. I want it off. Turn it off right now. I need a break. I can't get a freaking break to even pee. I want it off. And I said, if you guys don't turn it off, I'm turning it off. <laughs> like I was just, I kind of flipped the switch. Good for and you. 
And she said, you know, she, and I told her, I said, they're not so God awful painful. I said, yeah, they're intense. I said, this is nothing to compare to what I'm used to. I was like, but I can't get a break. And, and if you can't my- get a break, then your baby baby's doesn't. not get a break. Right. Yeah. And that becomes and unsafe tell- for the, 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 the labor is now could be unsafe for the baby. If your uterus isn't getting a break, if the baby's not getting a break, if you're not getting a break. So you were yes. right to ask, turn, turn it off. And, um, at that point, like I said, I just wasn't going to break. I was so frustrated. And it, you know, back labor is a completely different animal. Yes. Like it is so intense, so strong. And so at that point she said, you know, she said, what if we just checked? I, it's like, she knew something was, off. she said, what if we just check? She said, guess what? We'll turn it off. We'll turn it off. But you know, you're just, let's just see where you're at. And I was like, okay. And so this wonderful resident comes in, I'll never forget. Uh, like I, I picked him and he comes in to check me. And right as he goes to check me, I was like, nope. And I flipped back over hands and knees. Yeah. And it took like maybe two contractions before he could check me because they just, again, they kept coming back to back. And he finally checks me. And like I said, the timeline, like here it was like 1035. And I went from a two and a half to a seven, a hundred, zero station. Oh, I'm not and really, that, like, well, no. I'm not really that surprised by that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, and it was like, as well, a no birthing person, wonders. you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And even I was like, holy hey, crap. I'm going and, to transition right now. Yes. And I just remember in my head thinking, all right, girl. This is what she wanted. There is no going back. (laughs) And so it was like, okay. And so they called my doctor and he was like 20 minutes away at the time. Um, And so he was like, okay, well, I'm coming in, set up a pack. And at this point, it's kind of like I was in my zone. I was just, I was hands and knees at the time, listening to music. I just couldn't, you know, I was so focused on the contractions. And and, um, he came in around 11 I think he got there really quickly and um I think at one point I had him check and I was a nine and a half but a very nine and a half zero station like she just wasn't coming down and um it was a very tight nine and a half and I wasn't very pushy yet but I was just getting to the point where I was just done. You know, I couldn't stay still. And that was one thing that kind of kept me going, going natural is I wasn't a fan of the head of anesthesia at the time. We did not get along. Okay. And so (laughs) I did not want to see this person, but at the same time, I thought of, you know, there is no way I could stay still. There is no way in God's green earth with this back labor, I could stay still. So I need to just keep going. (laughs) (laughs) So it was a very tight nine and a half. I know urge to push. And um, finally, I was really feeling it in my lower left back at that time. Okay. And my my nurse was like, well, what if you just tried the peanut ball? Kind of like a fire hydrant pose. Yeah, good. And I was like, okay. Because at this point, I didn't want to move. But I never, laying I just on hand your right side. I do. Laying on your right um, side. I was actually hands and knees oh, with my with left leg, leg like oh, peeing on a fire hydrant. Perfect. I love it. Great position. <laughs> and that uh, next thing you know, like that's what changed the contractions. And it was still in my back a little bit, but like not, it basically completely changed it. Yeah, because she so rotated. Pressure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it wasn't so much rectal pressure, maybe a little bit, but more vaginal. And at that point, I just was like, I remember looking at my doctor and I was like, can I just push now? And he was like, yeah, listen to your body. If you feel like you got to push, push. And so it took a while to push with her. And and you know, it's so funny is I had, you know, really try to become empowered. I took lots of different classes. I watched tons of birth videos. I listened to podcasts. I um, read Ida Mae Gaskin's Guide to Childbirth book. And, you know, in the book, they're like, it felt so good to push. And for me, pushing is not a good time. The the feeling of my body stretching as far apart as it possibly can, to me, does not feel good. I mean, I don't think a lot of people would say it feels great. 
<laughs> yes. And so I was like, holy cow, I, you know, and, and like, the funny part for me is when I'm having a baby, I have like all these conversations in my head of panic. And I remember thinking, you know, I was completely prepared for everything, but I did not prepare for this. And so I'm pushing, I'm kind of doing wimpy pushes at this point because it's like, I don't like the feeling of pushing, but I can't stand the contractions either. So there's only, but it was not a reflex. One option. It was not a reflex. No. Okay. I did not have the reflex with her. And I, I think I was saying some funny things at one point I could feel her come down as I pushed and then she would come back up and then she would come down and then she would come back up. And I remember looking at my husband and he to this day still laughs at me about it because I was, I was serious and I looked at him all mad and I was like, I am literally prairie dogging her right now. Oh my God. I love it. It's just so funny. He just started cracking up and my OB goes and my OB looks and he was like, wow, you are really in tune with your body. She is going up and down. Yeah. Okay, this is hilarious. And a lot of times when I'm like at a birth and I'm witnessing it, the 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 person who's giving birth will go. Like when the contraction ends and the head starts to go back up, the birthing person goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's how I felt. I was like, what the heck is going on right now? And you know, like with my son, I never felt rectal pressure because that epidural was so heavy. And I know some people, when they have the epidural, they still feel the urge to push. No. Yeah. So again, this was completely new to me. And so finally I'm like, just get her out. And so I remember pushing and right as I got done pushing, she was crowning. And that's kind of, again, a panic sets in because the contraction disappeared. And I'm like, I have nothing without a contraction. I remember looking at my husband. I was like, what do I do? She's just right there, but she's not coming out. What do I do? Wait for the contraction. Yes. And my doctor is like such a cheerleader. He's like, yeah, you're doing great. And you can always tell when someone's doing really good because he gets louder and louder. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like a cheerleader. (laughs) And, um, I pushed and then there she was. And I just remember him very quietly going, he, he goes, she's out. Um, go ahead and pick up your baby. And I looked down and she's between my legs because I pushed hands and knees. Aww. And I picked her up and she was hilarious. as so she was this teeny tiny, almost like borderline redhead baby, strawberry blonde, which she's super blonde now pale skin tone seven pounds i mean she was so little so little but your gestation was was earlier too Mm -hmm. but and i was just talk about the birth high from all get out i mean i was just like she's here i'm crying my husband's crying i mean it was just the most amazing birth experience that that you could ever experience. And I just was like, wow. And um, so she was born and it was just, everything just went so good. With our firstborn, we, he had a tongue tie that wasn't diagnosed for years. And so what, even though it, we did breastfeed, there was a lot of problems with that. And she latched on right away. She did so good. I almost never took her off my chest and, um, she like I said she breastfed it was just so so amazing you know we didn't bathe her like I said she stayed with me the whole time it was just this incredible high and I remember getting up to go to the bathroom which is one of the best parts about not having an epidural you can just get up it feels really good when you don't have an epidural to just get up and take a shower (laughs) too yes and I I literally remember looking at my husband I was like I want to do that again Mm -hmm. So the first, you had an episiotomy. The second, did you have tearing? I had a slight labial tear. So my perineum actually never tore. But um, on my right side, I had just a slight labial tear. But they didn't even repair it because it was just, it wasn't, it healed, like quit bleeding. It really wasn't a big deal. We rarely see tearing on hands and knees. Rarely. Yes, And actually what was funny is I remember when I tore because I specifically remember feeling it. And in my head, I thought my OB had touched me. And so when it happened, I whip around and I give him this look like I will destroy you. And he like, he's not even close to touching me. No. (laughs) So it was just kind of funny. Like I thought it was him and it, it wasn't, but yeah, no, no perineal tear at all. And, but when I said that to my husband, he was just kind of like, uh, 
<laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Amazing. So it went so, so good. So, so perfect. I did the irony of a nurse five hours later, have a very massive postpartum hemorrhage that resulted in me getting wheeled back to the labor side from the postpartum side. Um, they what? almost ended up having to do a bockery balloon and um, thankfully they didn't, but I, I got all the drugs, um, you know, they had to manually go up there. That was not a good time. Just but retained you know placenta. What? I think there was some retained placenta. Um, Cause I just remember being postpartum. My son finally came to meet his sister and it felt like the faucet got turned on. I mean, I could just remember feeling blood for anatomy. Yeah. But what's crazy is the next day I, you never would have guessed I lost as much blood as I did. I felt so good the next day. Well, we've, and... you've told t several stories of bleeding a lot. And when I asked you about anemia, you were like, I don't know, which means I think you have a, a lot of iron reserves. I think I do. And, you know, it's funny. Part of me is like, I wonder if I have some kind of, you know, bleeding disorder or if it's because I've got a little bit of red hair because there's definitely a correlation with me and birth and surgeries and <laughs> all those things. Yeah. Um, but then there but she was. was. There she was, your rainbow yes. baby. Yes. And it was just, it was so good. And it was so great. And she was just my best eater. Even at six months, she we did baby lead weeding with her. It was just so like it was, it was just this amazing healing. It truly was. It was a healing experience. It was like healing from the past birth, healing from trauma. And it was just awesome. So Kelly, <laughs> it is now Clayton's turn because he is yes. really wanting to be on this podcast. So yes, he is. how did you know that you were in labor? So two years later, you're getting ready to give birth again. How did you know mm -hmm. that you were in labor this time? So last time you had just gotten off shift. You were tired. Yes. So this time. So this time was very, it was different. It was very stressful. You know, keep in mind it was 2021. We had been dealing with all the COVID BS. People on my floor were literally quitting left and right. So if you want to talk major short staffing. And I just remember the day before being like, oh my God, can I just have this baby? And the next morning, it was so funny. I should have known because the day before I was cleaning house and he felt like he was in this weird position. You know, I had this passion of like learning positions between my daughter and my son. And um, he was in this weird position the day before. The day of comes, he's finally back to my left side. I'm like, for once, I'm going to have front labor. I go downstairs. My basement is trashed. I had just cleaned it the day before. So <laughs> here I am Saturday morning, and I'm just going off on my nine-year-old because I'm like, I just cleaned this house, and my water breaks again. And I was like, are you serious? So, I mean, really three times in a row you prommed. Because the, yeah. the first one, they gave you Cervidil, but you still prommed, right? Like, yes. so third prom, premature rupture of the membranes in a row. Okay, so you it's hear- What's crazy, it was the same gestational time as my son. So Riley and Clayton, my water broke the same gestation. Is that not wild? That is wild. That is wild. Hopefully it wasn't 11 days postpartum. I know it wasn't, but I was just- you right, because I know 11 is your number. Oh, man. So tell me what yeah. it felt like for your water to break. So this time it was it wasn't quite like this intense trickle like Riley, but it was definitely like this. This like gush like twice. And so I'm like, here we go again. And um, like I said, it just just like a quick spurt, I guess. Okay. Now um, this so time I called my. Oh, sorry. What? I was going to say <laughs> now this time, do we stay home or do we go to the hospital? Yes. <laughs> Well, this time, a part of me was like, you know, I was seven centimeters dilated. And quite honestly, had I rated my contractions on a scale of staying home and going to the hospital, I probably would not have gone in. Wow. Like, because they weren't that intense. And so I just remember thinking, I really just don't know if I can trust my body enough to not have a baby on one of the busiest highways in Kansas. That to me is not a good time. Nope. So, um, I called my mom to come watch the kids. I ate breakfast before I went in. I called my doctor. I made a joke to him about if he wanted to go shop at Costco because he has this like habit about him where he goes to Costco and then we have to call him back for a delivery. So 
And he was so amazing. Like it was a Saturday, it was his day off. And he was like, you're going to do fantastic. It's going to be great. You've got this. And, you know, I was really worried about who was working that day and who was the laborist on call that could potentially be there if he doesn't make it in time. And he's like, he, and he's like, I've got a family event tonight, but if you need me to stay, I will stay. Like he was so good. So we go to the hospital, but on the way to the hospital, my contractions actually did pick up about every three minutes. They weren't that intense, but they were about every three minutes apart, which was shocking. Wow. And okay. right away. We get to the hospital. Yes. And I was like, oh, this is new. This is good. And they were in the front for once. And I was like, holy cow, I'm having front labor. I've always had back labor. And so we get to the hospital. Contractions, of course, disappear. And my OB is there. We go ahead and check. And I think I was a three. I was like a three minus two. And he's like, well, I'll be around. Call when you're ready. And I was like, and so I jokingly was like, you know, if this is a terrible family event, I could totally get you out of it. And, you know, we laughed. So he leaves. <laughs> And at this point, you know, my work family's there and I really love them, but they kind of kept coming in and out. And I'm like, guys, go away. <laughs> I need to focus. Yeah. You know, it's been a rough pregnancy just because of everything going on as a nurse during shirt staffing during COVID. Like I just need to labor on my own. And um, at this time, I knew stuff with the pelvis, right? So we tried to do some things to get contractions picking up again. They weren't really doing it. I was trying to do lift and tucks, but I kept feeling myself clenching my pelvic floor. So I would sit down and do them, which I felt I do those with patients too, sitting down. And I felt like it was really effective and contractions finally picked up about one thirty. Okay. And, um, so they finally started being more regular about one thirty. Keep in mind, my water broke at like seven fifty five, and they finally picked up. Well, we did, I had my nurse help me into sideline relief. And we went, when we got done with this, the right side, I looked at her and I said, oh God, they're in my back again. And she looks at me and I look at her and I'm like, crap. Just do the other side. So <laughs> yeah, well, I had done the left. I'd done like just nothing, you know? And so at this point I'm doing dips. I'm trying to do anything to reset. I'm trying to do whatever I can to get off my back. No, that's just apparently how things are going to go. And, um, what felt good was hanging on to my husband, tilting my pelvis forward. So we did that for several contractions. I attempted the toilet, but for me, it just does not feel good for the back labor. It just doesn't make it easier. But what did feel good was sitting in a throne position on the bed with my pelvis tilted forward. Okay. And it worked out because from time to time, you know, we did intermittent monitoring. So it wasn't continuous monitoring of the heart rate. It was just from time to time. And so that kind of made it work out. And my nurse would come in. She was amazing. We would talk. And as things started picking up, her and my husband would take turns putting their hands on my chest. That kind of grounded me. Mm -hmm. Well, at, I'm trying to think, at like three o'clock, I was like, man, these are a lot stronger, but they just... They're very strong. They're not regular at all, but they're very strong. And I said, can we maybe check? And she's like, well, okay. And I was a five and baby was still high. And I remember looking at her just completely bewildered. And I was like, I was a seven on Pitocin and these contractions are stronger. What the hell is that about? And I just remember just looking at her being like, a five? Are you effing kidding me? Only a five? What the? Like, but like a a cervix doesn't dilate like linearly. You know what I mean? You can yes. go, you can literally go from five to 10 in one contraction. Yes. And I think, well, I know now that I know, which makes me so happy that again, I did not trust. <laughs> Um, I was just really glad we came in when we did because she goes, well, let's flip the hands and knees. That's what worked for you with Riley. Let's go to the hands and knees. So we did hands and knees. And what was cool is at that point, I was like, okay, she's at this station. So I'm going to sway my hips side to side on hands and knees because that opens the mid pelvis. And next thing I know, I'm looking at her and I was like, something is happening. I can feel him moving down. And she's like, good, do a few more contractions. And I was at this point where it literally 
it literally Heidi it was just a blur I mean I was in my zone everything was going happening so fast the back labor became so intense I I never screamed but I was definitely making some extremely loud oh noises and I could just keep feeling something and I and I looked at her and I was like please check me Something's off. please check me so 50 minutes after she checked me when I was a five and I was like what the heck I was an eight yeah, and exactly. so I set up in bed and I text because she pages my doctor and I was like, no, we don't have time. I set up in bed and I text him and I'm like, I am an eight, please come right now. And it was so funny because that's when I could feel he was coming out, whether I was going to push or not. And that fetal ejection reflex, very, it was, it kind of like not scared me, but I just remember being like, oh God, like this isn't stopping. He's coming out. And so my OB was like, I'll be in there in 10 minutes. And, you know, my nurse is like, he'll be there in 10. And I was like, he's not going to wait. And I was like, call the laborist in. She needs to be here. Keep in mind, it's so funny. I tend to get naked with my natural births because I get so hot. So God bless her. I love her so much. The laborist comes in and I'm just looking at like, I'm just like, what is going? This rectal pressure is intense. This kid is trying to come out to the point that I'm kind of holding him in yeah, because it was so intense. And so she's, my wonderful nurse is getting, putting as hot of washcloths as she can near my butt and perineum because I was like, this is not really good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my OB had to have been speeding because he got there way less than 10 minutes. And he's like, you've got this, listen to your body. You're doing great. You know, never even checked me. He's just like, you're doing so good. <laughs> and, you know, in my head, I'm like, why is this? It's just so funny because in my head I'm panicking. I'm like, why is this so fast? <laughs> and because um, it's your third baby, <laughs> third baby, and um, he's like, "You're doing great. Just keep going, yeah." And I look at my husband between contractions, and I said, "I am not having a good time." <laughs> <laughs> and finally, in my head, I'm like, "Get it together. You need to calm down." He's coming out just as soon as this baby's out, it's going to be fine. Like I'm telling myself this. And again, I'm doing like, I'm moving my body. I'm kind of putting my knees together because I know that's what he needs to come out. Like I said, such a cool experience knowing how the body works. And one push, he's crowning. And then the other push, I mean, I could feel this intense shoulder come out. And I sit back and I'm like, holy crap, I just gave birth to a toddler. Because he was so big. This, he was so big. And it wow. was so amazing. Like, I'm holding him and he was crying. And I'm like, hi, Clayton. Hello. Hi. And it was so good. We And what was cool was after my recovery, I got up and I measured him and weighed him. There's a video on my Instagram. I just, it was so cool to get to get up and to assess my own baby. Yeah. And he was nine pounds 22 inches long I mean he was and of course babies are swollen when they're born so he just looked massive yeah no by the way those nine and ten pound babies are so delicious they're so puffy yeah I love it oh I loved it so much and I feel like that's part of why he was just he was coming out there was yeah. no with with my seven pounder I had to work to get her out and him he was like nope mom I am making a I'm barreling you know, I'm through a there mom um yes Clayton we just told your story dude yeah. Thanks for being on the podcast. Now you're be quiet. So, Kelly, what time was that? What time was what was time of delivery? So he was born at four thirty six. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. So third, we always say third babies are like the wild cards, but I think everything that you learned with positioning your pelvis, your pelvis moves. And the fact yes. that you moved and you did these movements and you were tapped into your intuition yes. and you were locked into like what felt right versus what felt wrong. Like you said, the yes. toilet is a feeling of wrongness. Hands and knees felt like a feeling of like, like not comfort, but comfort, right? Or the throne position too. Yeah. Every single baby, every body, every pelvis you have to find that right position at the right time. Yes. I just remember thinking, he's high. I need to do this. Okay. He's middle. He's mid pelvis. Let me try this. And it, 
it worked. I mean, I literally so in tune could just feel it. Like it was like a stepping stairs. I could just feel and go boom. Yeah. It was so crazy. It's so cool. And for everyone listening that isn't a labor and delivery nurse or a doula, you know, these are reasons to hire a doula, especially one that's yes. trained in spinning babies and labor physicians to help you do what Kelly did on her own, which is so incredible. So and that was no Pitocin. No Pitocin. <laughs> and you know that you have prom. So if you have any more, it's going to be prom to delivery, as you know. Um, shout out to your OB who saw you through everything really and yes. balanced your hormones and helped you have these rainbow and redemptive birth experiences and I love what you're doing on Instagram please share your Instagram handle so everyone can follow you yes and is it Kelly labor nurse or Kelly the labor nurse Kelly, the labor nurse Kelly Kel with an I Kelly with an I the labor nurse you guys Please go follow Kelly. She's putting out really great content. And I hope you listen to both episodes if that felt safe for you. And Kelly, thank you so much for sharing this amazing yeah. journey of five pregnancies and three births and the what you learned each step of the way. And you have such a beautiful family. So thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the birth you want, no matter what that looks like.